Mark chapter 14, verse 25 to verse 28. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. I've selected a brief passage today, purposely, because in this brief passage, Jesus tells his disciples two truths. He wants them to know two things, to encourage them and to prepare them for the coming trial. He wants to convey two truths. He wants them to know these two things because he wants them to be prepared for the trial they are going to face, for the difficult, terrible circumstance they are about to face. It's not just us who are going through challenges. Us in 2024, we think sometimes we're the only ones going through challenges, but no, even the disciples went through all kinds of challenges. And, uh, you know, the disciples are about to face a very difficult time because in just a few hours, Jesus is going to be arrested. We're at that point now. He's going to leave the, I mean, in, this, in the passage that I read, he leaves the upper room, goes toward the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be arrested, put on trial, flogged and crucified. Basically, they are going to drag Jesus away. And this is going to shock the disciples. Just put yourself in the shoes of the disciples. You know, they have left everything and followed Jesus. And they believed that he's the Messiah. By now, at least a little bit of belief like that. You know, they believe that he's the Messiah. And he's their future. And he is the key and all that. And suddenly he's dragged away in the middle of the night. Everything is thrown into disarray. Imagine what they would have felt like. They're going to go through the roughest period of their lives up to now. And Jesus prepares them by telling them two things, teaching them two truths. He wants them to know two things. And I believe these two truths are relevant for us today also. It was not just that he told these two things to them in that day. But I believe he wants us to know these two truths. I believe they apply for all Christians living at all times and places. What are these two truths? Truth number one is in verse 25. These truths that he wants the disciples to know that will help them will also help us. The first truth is in verse 25. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, whether you understand it or not, just on first sight itself, you know this is something important. You know he's trying to say something important because he begins it with, truly I say to you. Truly I say to you. When Jesus opens a saying like that, you know he's trying to call attention to it. Truly I say, some uh, the older King James will say, verily I say to you, you know. Or some translations, assuredly, certainly, in Tamil, mayagave. But in the original it's the word Amen, Amen. You know the word Amen, right? It's not an English word. We use some words as Christians that are not English, really. Amen is not an English word. Hallelujah is not an English word. Both these words are Hebrew words used by the Jews. They're found in the Old Testament. They're part of the Hebrew language. Why do we use them? Well, they were used by the earliest people of God, which were the Jews. And, uh, you know, we copy their language, really. And in this, in this case, we have taken the very words itself. Uh, hallelujah means praise be to Yahweh. <laughs> That's what hallelujah is short for Yahweh, you know. Uh, praise be to Yahweh. And amen, what does amen mean? Amen means something like so be it. We use amen today when I say, say the prayer in church. At the end of the prayer, all of you join me and say amen, right? Why? What you're doing is when you say amen, you're saying, I agree with that prayer. So be it. Let it happen just like that prayer. <laughs> Let it happen just like he prayed, you know. That's the function of amen. Usually it affirms some truth, God's truth. In the Old Testament, you will see the prophets, sometimes they will speak the word of God and the people will respond saying amen. 
And so usually it comes at the end of some words given by God. You know, God's words are spoken and the end uh, people affirm by saying, Amen. But Jesus' usage is very unique. Scholars look at the way Jesus uses this Amen and they are stunned because it's not like he's saying something and people are responding Amen. He is saying Amen himself. And furthermore, he is not saying it at the end of something. He's saying it at the beginning of something. So it's truly I say to you, that is Amen I say to you. <laughs> That's only translated as Amen I say to you. Amen. It's more very strange. You know, scholars are puzzled by the way he uses that. It's a very puzzling, very unique way he uses it. They, they can't find this similar kind of usage, you know. Why does he do it like that? Why does he put it upside down, uses amen in the beginning and says it himself, amen, I said to you, means he does it, I think, to grab their attention. He does it, I think, to say, to point out that what he's about to say is very important. I think he does it to point out that you can believe in what he's about to say. You can be sure about it, even if it is hard to believe. So I think he does it purposely to call attention and to point out something's important and to give us assurance that you can believe what he's about to say even if it's hard to believe. Sometimes he will say like for example, truly I say to you, unless a person becomes like a little child, he will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, because that's a hard saying, right? Sometimes those hard sayings have that uh, truly and that's what happens here you know Jesus is saying what I'm about to say is important you can believe it even if it's hard to believe you can believe it in other words what he's saying here is a big deal verse 25 has some big truth whether you understand it or not let's begin with that assumption that in verse 25 Jesus is trying to say something big something significant something important something we need to know and believe what is that I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now recall the context here. They have just finished the last supper and Jesus has you know, broken the bread and given it and blessed the wine and also given it and they have finished drinking it. It's done. And he ends by saying these words, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine. So after drinking of that wine, the Jews... He says, I will not drink again of this grape juice or wine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So he's finished drinking. He's saying, I won't drink it again until that day. What day? Until that day, I won't drink it. This is vow language. I don't know if you recognize that. This, it's like he's making a vow. I won't drink it until I drink it with you on that day. You know, like people will say, I won't eat until I do this or something like that. You know, there are examples of this in the Bible itself where people take vows or, uh, for example, in Acts 23, 40 Jewish guys get together and they take a vow saying, we won't eat or drink until we kill Paul. They want to kill Paul, you know. <laughs> They've had it with Paul. He's going around preaching the gospel, exalting Christ. They just absolutely hate it. And so they come together and they say, we decide. We solemnly promise one another that we will not eat or drink until Paul is dead. I don't know what happened to them because Paul remained alive for quite a while. <laughs> this is in Acts 23. So Jesus is saying, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine. I won't drink of wine or grape juice or whatever you until I drink it new in the kingdom of until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God what day there's one little detail missing in Mark which is in Matthew it's just one little detail missing in Mark it's in Matthew 26 29 where Jesus says I won't drink until that day when I drink it new with you with you everybody say with you so he's saying, I won't drink again of this wine. I won't drink again of the fruit of the vine. That is the grapefruit, right? I won't drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it with you on that day in my father's kingdom. What day is he talking about? Let's look at the clues carefully. He says, that day when I drink it new with you in my father's 
kingdom. The best explanation for this is, he's talking about that final day when the kingdom is in its full-blown form and we will celebrate the marriage supper of the lamb, if you will, or the messianic banquet, if you will. You know, you know the Bible talks about how in the end, when Jesus returns and his people are gathered to him, that uh, we will have a, a celebration, a marriage feast. And uh, we, the church, the bride, will feast and celebrate with the bridegroom who is Christ. You, you know that the Bible teaches that, right? It looks like he's referring to that. It looks like he's referring to that. Jesus teaches about that uh, banquet or that feast in several parables. For example, Matthew 22, 1, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this uh, a feast, a wedding feast that the king arranged for his son and he sent out invitations and the people who got the invitations first, they took it lightly and they said, we're busy, we cannot come, you know. <laughs> Jesus tells the parable like that. And so they came and reported back to the king saying, all the, these fellows you invited, they're saying they're too busy to come for your son's uh, wedding. So, so then the king says, okay, go into the highways, into the byways, invite everybody, go. <laughs> These people who said don't want, you know, that's their loss. Go everywhere, invite everybody. And probably what Jesus means is, well, the invitation first went out to the Jews. <laughs> it first went out to the Jews. It didn't come to us. And then it came to us, you know, and so on. So the idea that one day after this life is over or Jesus returns first, whatever it is, when we are joined with Jesus, we will celebrate in a marriage feast. There will be a big celebration where we will be joined to Jesus, all the believers, and um, not only Jesus, but all the saints of old, you know, like uh, Jesus talks about how in Matthew 8, he says, uh, people from the east and the west will come and they will dine with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven and all that, you know. So the Bible again and again talks about this feasting that is coming in the end. Somehow it seems to end with feasting, not fasting, you know. There's feasting and fasting in the Bible, but there seems to be a little more feasting. And certainly it ends with feasting. Whether people like it or not seems to be like God likes it. He has it end in one big celebration, feast. So let's get back. What is Jesus saying? It looks like what Jesus is saying is, after drinking the wine, he keeps the cup or the glass, and then he says, I won't drink of this again until I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom in the end. That means what? That means, he's saying, this is a vow. <laughs> he's saying, I, after this, I will be sure to drink it with you again in the end. Okay, can you see that it's a vow? <laughs> he's saying, this is not the last time we're going to drink it. Listen, <laughs> this is important because in a few hours he's going to be arrested, crucified. And then they're going to think it's the end. He's saying, no, it's not the end. I won't drink it again, but I will when we drink it together in my father's kingdom on that final day. That means, you know what he's saying, what the implication is, I will do what is necessary to take you all the way from where you are today to that final destination so that you are with me in my father's kingdom on that final day and we eat and drink at my father's table, you know, in my father's kingdom, and we celebrate. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I won't leave you until I take you all the way there. I won't be without taking you to the other shore, to that final destiny, cause you to reach safely, so that you not only inherit the kingdom, but you reach that final destiny where you meet with me and you celebrate with me for all eternity. That's what he's saying. Did you see that? This is a vow. This is like a veiled promise. It's a solemn promise. He's saying, this is not the last time we'll drink together. I'll see to it that we'll drink it again. And I won't drink it until we drink it together, you and me, on that final day. So basically, in this one solemn vow or promise, 
you have everything from the last supper to the marriage supper of the lamb everything is included you know what jesus is saying he is saying whatever i need to do to take you from where you are and to make you join with me on that final day whatever i need to do to make sure it happens i will do it if i need to die i will die that's what he's going to do next because unless he dies we cannot join him on that final day unless he sheds his blood unless he gives his life as a ransom for us we cannot be with him forever whatever i need to do to take you there make sure you are with me in that final celebration i will do whatever it takes i will die to make it happen i won't drink wine until i do whatever is necessary to defeat everything that's in the way and bring my father's kingdom bring you into my father's kingdom so it involves the cross right there people usually say you know i will die or accomplish my goal you know that's attitude of some people i will die or accomplish my goal you know well jesus attitude is i will die to accomplish my goal <laughs> i will die to take you there <laughs> to make you reach there i will die for you you know the cross is there also the resurrection is there i will rise again i will have the gospel preached to you everything is there <laughs> i will lead you to hear it i will help you to believe it i will help you through all the challenges of life i will prepare you for my return i will always be with you i will do whatever it takes to take you from here to there to prepare you what everything everything is included in that to dying for you rising preaching the gospel you hearing it you believing it you changing you getting transformed you getting ready for his return uh, you preparing to meet him everything 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 i will make sure you sit with me in that final celebration that's what he's saying i take a vow not to drink this until i get you there so that i'll drink it with you again there he wanted them to know this he wanted them to know this that night that's why he said it truly i say to you i won't drink of this again just with that one glass he makes a vow you know people make a toast but he makes a vow he puts it down and he says i won't drink it again until i drink it with you in that final day that means i'll make sure you're there with me that's what it means it's a veiled promise if you have eyes you can see it he wanted them to know this and he wanted them to believe it now do you think these words apply to us also or do you think it only applied to them you know what do you think i think it applies to us also often times what is said to the original disciples apply to all jesus disciples right we are also his disciples in one sense although not original maybe not the original 12 but it applies to us so many things he told them applies to us do this in remembrance of me he told them right he told them do this in remembrance of me about communion and we are doing it even though he told them we are doing it because it applies he told them only go into all the world preach the gospel make disciples baptize them and uh, teach them what i have given you but we are doing it even though he told them He told them I'm with you always to the end of the age but we say it applies to us also this also applies to us <laughs> because we also will be in that marriage supper of the lamb won't we it's not just that the disciples will be in the marriage supper in that final banquet we also will be there not only the as i said jesus himself says in matthew 8 you know people will come from the east and the west and they will join abraham isaac and jacob in that final you know banquet <laughs> in the kingdom of heaven we also will be there so it applies to us also just as jesus wanted them to know this he wants us to know this today he wants us to know that he will do whatever is necessary on his part to take us all the way to the end so that we join him in that final celebration he wants us to know that he is radically committed to us jesus in, in common words in verse 25 basically jesus is saying i am radically committed to you this is a very high priority for me to get you home to be with me forever 
This is very important for me. And I want you to know that. I want you to know that I promise you, I will do whatever is necessary to get you home. Isn't this truth taught everywhere in the scriptures? Doesn't this truth apply to us? Isn't this, you know, Jesus basically in, in this place is making a commitment to save us to the end. That's what's happening in verse 25. It's truly I say to you, he's making a commitment to save us to the end. And I would point to not only this verse, but I would say this is just the, the beginning of this kind of teaching in the New Testament. In fact, this kind of teaching is found throughout the Bible, Old and New Testament, that God is committed to his people, not just for now, but forever, that God who has begun a good work in us will be faithful to complete it. How many places does the Bible teach this kind of truth that he is, God is committed, Jesus is committed to us, to saving us to the end. Jesus has promised us that he will save us to the end. And basically Jesus vows to save us to the end. He's saying, you know, we'll drink again. <laughs> How's that, right? It's like some people you meet, right? And we say bye, they'll say, we'll meet again. See you later. Well, that could be just simply, you know. It could mean nothing. See you later, maybe, maybe not. But you know, when God says see you later, he's going to see you later. You know what I mean? This is no ordinary see you later. This is like a vow. I won't drink of this again until I drink it with you on that final day. We will meet face to face. We will drink. We will eat. We will enjoy. We will celebrate. Jesus is committing himself saying, I'll do whatever is necessary to take you home. I'll never let you down. I will be faithful to you till the end. And this truth is taught everywhere in the scriptures. You know, I'll just point you to some of Jesus' own words in other places, like in the Great Commission, the way he ends it after saying, go everywhere, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize them, teach them. He says, behold, I am with you, even to the end of the age. I'm with you always. Don't worry, I'll be with you till the very end, forever. That's what he means. I will never leave you nor forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5. Or John 14, verse 1 to 3 is a very similar passage because there also he's speaking in the upper room before the cross and he's preparing their hearts for the coming trial and he's telling his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. Don't be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, he says, to his disciples he's telling them listen they're gonna soon all kinds of things are gonna happen and you're not gonna understand you're gonna be perturbed they're gonna drag me away they're gonna put me on the cross but here, here's what I'm doing I am going to prepare a place for you because unless he dies and sheds his blood he cannot prepare a place for us I'm gonna prepare a place for you and I'll come back not just rise again and then visit you and then ascend but I'll come back one day and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you to myself so that where I am you may be also that's John 14 2 3 I'm gonna go but I'll come back and I'll take you to be where I am I'll, you'll be with me You'll be, I'm, he's saying you will be, be with me in the end. That's the end. The end is not your retirement. The end is not your, you know, six by three box in the ground. <laughs> the end is you will be with me <laughs> forever. And I'm committed to doing whatever is necessary for that. In John 17, 24, the great high priestly prayer, the greatest prayer, I think. Jesus praying before going to the cross. And his final petition in that great prayer, in verse 24, he's praying it for all the believers who are ever going to live. That's clear in John 17, 20. If you read John 17, 20 onwards, and you come to 24, the final petition, Jesus prays to the Father saying, Father, I desire that uh, believers should see my glory and be with me where I am. <laughs> they should be with me where I am so that they should see my, so that they can see my. He's saying, Father, here's what I want finally. I want those who believe in me. 
I want them to be with me where I am forever so that they can see my true glory. So that they can be satisfied with me. You believe, Christians believe in the power of prayer, right? We believe when we pray itself, God may hear our prayer. Yeah, I hope God will hear our prayer. But sometimes Christians think, oh, well, if I go to the pastor and he prays, you know, um, is more likely to be heard. Well, what if Jesus prays? You believe in the power of Jesus' prayer? He prayed on that night and he continues to intercede for us. Hebrews 7.25 says, He lives forever to intercede for us and therefore he is able to save us to the end. (laughs) Hebrews 7.25, right? He is able to save them to the uttermost since he lives forever to make intercession for them. Because Jesus lives forever and he continually makes intercession for us. He is able to save us to the end, to the end. So this teaching is found everywhere. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. You know, he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. He, God, is faithful to keep you from stumbling and so on. Again, all over the Bible is there. Point is what? Point is, Jesus is saying, I'm committed to you. It's like in a marriage, you know, the husband commits, makes vows to the wife, and the woman makes vows to the man, right? And it's the giving, exchanging of the vows that gets them married in the Christian ceremony. Huh? <laughs> they make a vow to each other, and their vow is taken seriously. And then they make a vow in the eyes of the law of the land, you know. Jesus is committing himself to us, saying, I'll do whatever is necessary to take you home. I'll be with you forever. I'll never let you down. I'll be faithful to you. That's truth number one. That's truth number one. Jesus wants you to know that he has committed himself to you. That's why he went and died. That's why he rose again. And intercedes for us. That's why he continually does the things that he does. How else do you think you heard the gospel? He made it so that you hear the gospel. He made it so that, you know, we are in some corner in Chennai. This is a corner. Biblically, Chennai is a corner. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know Chennai is a great city and all that. But biblically, its center is Jerusalem. <laughs> Chennai is some... Way out there. But God has made sure we heard it down here. And there's a church like this in Chennai. This is Jesus fulfilling his commitment to his people. He's making the gospel go out, making us to hear it, helping us to believe it, helping us through the challenges of life and so on. And he's saying, I'm committed to you forever. I'm committed to you forever. Know it. You should know it. Truth number two. Second truth you should know is in verse 27. Verse 27. First truth is, I will never let you down. I'm committed you, good to you forever. Second truth is verse 27. In verse 27. Before we get to verse 27, verse 26 is a transition. Uh, they sang a hymn and then they went out to the Mount of Olives, right? So this is the end of Jesus' uh, stay in that upper room. The Last Supper is over. They end by singing a hymn. Who sang the hymn? Disciples and Jesus. Some people are doubtful whether Jesus sings, you know. I'm sure he sings. The Jews just cannot be without singing, by the way. And Jesus was a Jew. (laughs) They sang. They means including Jesus, right? There are other indications also in the Bible that Jesus sings. But they sang and most likely they say the hymn or hymns. We don't know how many actually. Our English translation seems to suggest it's only one, but actually the original seems to suggest we we don't know. It could be one hymn, many hymns, a few hymns, I guess. Uh, Most likely they say it was uh, probably Psalm 115 to 118. Those psalms were traditionally sung after the Passover meal was eaten. And uh, so they sang and then they go to the Mount of Olives. Why? Because Gethsemane is at the foot or near the Mount of Olives. That's why he's going there. And maybe on the way, he says these next words. Verse 27, Jesus said to them, here's the second truth I want you to see. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away. For as it is written, I'll strike the shepherd, sheep will be scattered. You will all, 
he says to all his disciples you will all fall away there is the second truth <laughs> what is the second truth the second truth is first truth is i will never let you down i am committed to you to forever i'll be faithful to you for ever second truth is sometimes you'll let me down yeah that's the second truth you will sometimes let me down <laughs> i will never let you down i'll never be unfaithful to you i will always be faithful to you but sometimes you will not be faithful to me that's the second truth he told them you will all everybody say all he is looking at all his disciples not just peter you'll deny me judas you'll betray me no you will all fall away you will all fall away he is referring to how when he is arrested he is going to go to the garden of gethsemane there he is going to pray after he prays judas will bring those roman soldiers or the maybe the jewish regiment probably had roman soldiers right and they will arrest jesus and when he is arrested all his disciples will flee they will leave him they will abandon jesus and they will flee that's what he's saying you will all fall away means when i am arrested you will all abandon me and run <laughs> that's exactly what happened in verse 50 or before we get to verse 50 how did they respond when jesus said you will all fall away that's when peter blurts out saying even if all fall i will not you know <laughs> and that's when jesus said you know before the night is over peter before morning comes before the rooster crows twice you will deny me three times and peter won't let go you know he said even if i have to die with you i will die but i will not deny you and then since peter says that you know every all the disciples jump in and say we also will not deny we are also ready to die with you you know <laughs> they don't know their own weakness they don't know themselves jesus knows their weakness and he says no you will all fall away and it happened exactly like he said verse 50 he's arrested and they all left him and fled verse 50 they all left him fled ran away <laughs> to me it's amazing when i come to a place like this it's amazing that these things are recorded and exposed in the bible just like this any other religion <laughs> you see next to jesus the heroes of the christian faith are the disciples the apostles <laughs> it is exposing their weaknesses and their faults their sins even just like that so openly you know they all forsook him and fled his top disciple denied him three times another guy his treasurer betrayed him <laughs> just exposes everything like that you know imagine how it would have been in the early church when peter and all the other apostles or the leaders there and everybody will be reading you know on the public reading of the scriptures they all forsook him and fled and there's you know james sitting there or you know john or <laughs> can you imagine that peter <laughs> in fact they say behind the gospel of mark is peter himself I can imagine Peter saying right it that's what happened we all fled we were cowards and we ran imagine that right so these were disciples who were with Jesus 3 and 1/2 years they saw what he did they heard his teaching they were with him he loved them they loved him they forsook all to follow him actually he was their future for them he was their everything you know they were ready to go they said we'll die with you just few minutes back they ate together and he makes a vow to them saying oh i won't leave you until i you know drink with you in my father's kingdom <laughs> but these guys all they all forsook him and fled it's a remarkable to me it's a it's one of those indications that the bible records truth the bible is a deposit of truth it doesn't care who it is it exposes the truth and that's why there is only one real hero in the bible and it's jesus the others all were zeros to begin with and he is the one who made them heroes they were not heroes to begin with everybody everybody the real hero in the bible is jesus is god he's the one who makes the others into heroes 
So Jesus is telling them beforehand what they are going to do. They don't even realize they're going to do it. But he's saying, I want you to know that when the time comes, you're going to let me down. That's what he's telling them. When the time comes, you're all going to abandon me. And I want you to know that I know it already. (laughs) Why did he tell them this? I think it was to prepare them, to help them. Because I can just imagine when they fled and abandoned Jesus and ran away. I can imagine the guilt that they would have felt. They would have thought, my goodness, we said we will never leave him. We said we'll die with him. And look, we just fled. We just ran away. How could we do this? And then they would have remembered, oh, but he told us we would. You know how much that would have helped them? He told us we would. And not only did he tell us we would, he continues. Look at verse 28. So in verse 27, he says, you will all fall away, right? Verse 28, after I'm raised up, I will go before you too. Most interesting verse. He says, you will, very casually, he says, you will all fall away. And then verse 28, but, everybody say but. That's a big but, you know. That's a significant but. But after I'm raised, there is so much in that one word but there. Because when he says but, it means it's a hint. It says it's not the end. Things won't be over just because you abandoned me and fled. It's not the end for you. Don't think your story is over. Don't think because you abandoned me and fled, I will abandon you. Don't think I'll never forgive you. Don't think this is the end for you. Don't think this ends our relationship. But after I am raised up, he says, but after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. What is he saying? He's saying, after the resurrection, I'll go before you to Galilee. What's he saying? He's saying, we'll meet up in Galilee. (laughs) Very casually, he says, you will all fall away. (laughs) And then after my resurrection, I'll go before you. I'll be waiting for you in Galilee. I want you to come there. Meet me. Don't think it's the end for you. I want you to come there, meet me, because I'll forgive you, and I got something great planned for you. I want to rock the world through you. I got a great ministry planned for you. It's amazing. The people that God uses. You go read even in Mark 16. Mark 16 is where Jesus you know, rises again from the dead, and he shows himself to the disciples. Even there, the disciples have trouble believing. And Jesus still works with them, you know. In the post-resurrection appearances you find in Luke, for example, you will see Jesus says, you know, because they find it hard to believe that Jesus really rose again. They're thinking, is it a ghost? Or what are we seeing? You know, our eyes are messing with us or whatever. So Jesus is saying, listen, you have some food? Give me some food. Just to demonstrate that he's not a ghost, he eats some fish, shows them. You know, he works with them. He's so patient with them. These people who forsook him and fled, abandoned him in his most needed hour. This was the most challenging time for Jesus himself. You can see that in the garden of Gethsemane. This was his most challenging moment and that's when they left him. And he knows they will. And knowing it in advance, he vows to them that he will never forsake them. He will, never, he will be faithful to them. He knows they will abandon him, but he still says, we'll meet again, we'll drink wine again in my father's kingdom, we'll celebrate in the end. (laughs) Amazing. And whatever I have to do to make sure you reach there, I'll do, I'll go die for you guys who abandon me. (laughs) The disciples did not begin as heroes. Mark is harshest to the disciples, just exposes their faults and everything. They say the only one who probably had the guts to do that must have been Peter. (laughs) But Jesus worked with them and was patient with them and to them he promised, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I will be faithful to you. So here's the thing, you know, this helped them in their hour of trial. Now, do you think this applies to us? Today, do you think that, you know, this truth applies to us? I think it applies to us. Is it only the disciples that uh, let Jesus down? Do we never let him down? Do we never forsake him sometimes? (laughs) Are we never unfaithful to our Lord Jesus? 
can we just look down on the disciples and what they did and say oh look they were cowards isn't it the case that sometimes some of us have been ashamed of the lord jesus in front of our friends family colleagues if they know we are christian we think they'll treat us bad they'll speak about us badly some of us have been ashamed of the lord jesus some of us have failed to glorify jesus where he has placed us i include myself some of us have even tainted his good reputation by that i mean we were supposed to glorify him but sometimes we bring him a bad name christians bring jesus a bad name sometimes isn't it true that we have all in some ways let jesus down isn't that the truth that's why i emphasize jesus told them you will all fall away you will all fall. not just peter not just judas all of you will let me down in some way shape or form at some point i think that is true of all christians in principle yeah it varies in degree just as it varied in degree with the disciples you know judas was the worst he betrayed him you know peter was the second worst he denied him three times but all the others were not guiltless they forsook him and fled they abandoned him in his hour of great need and similarly i think all god's people let jesus down in some way shape or form at some point that's the truth if we can't see that we are blinded if we can't see that we think too highly of ourselves that's what i would say some of us have failed to do his will some of us have rebelled against him this is true across the board i think and jesus is saying i want you to know that this is how it is i want you to know that i know that sometimes you will let me down let me say that again jesus is saying i want you to know that i know that sometimes you will let me down i know it and even though i know it i will tell you i will never let you down i will always be faithful to you know both these truths know both these truths jesus is saying know both these things i will never let you down sometimes you will let me down you got to know both if you don't know both you're in trouble if you don't keep both together you're in trouble you know because if you just know oh jesus will never let me down but if you don't realize that sometimes you will let him down you'll be so hard on yourself sometimes you'll get hopeless you see the danger of only knowing that okay jesus will never let me down but if you don't realize you will sometimes let him down when you do let him down and it will happen invariably in some way shape or form to some degree at some point when it happens you might get so hopeless you might just kind of give up and you may think oh you know you just don't deserve to live you don't deserve god's love you you know how can god forgive you how can god accept you how can god give you another chance and that's the way you will convince yourself sometimes why should jesus put up with me you will think so what's happening what the fault there is see this is key see that kind of person their problem is at their foundation their foundation is their faithfulness to jesus <laughs> their foundation is what their faithfulness as long as they were faithful you know oh they were oh yeah jesus will always be faithful to me he will never let me down as long as they were kind of okay but when they messed up now they think oh now how can jesus still put up with me you know so it reveals that their foundation is not god's faithfulness to them is rather their faithfulness to god it is very messed up it is messed up so when you do let him down you feel hopeless that shows that you don't know truth number 2 <laughs> 
you have not taken that to heart you have not really realized that sometimes you are the kind of person sometimes you know i include myself the, um, the, we are the kind of people because although we are redeemed living in this fallen world the, with the things that are happening we sometimes let him down that's the truth and if we don't realize that you know we could get hopeless if we do and when we do let him down or let me give you another uh, very contrasting example another case where you know a person doesn't know truth number 2 they have not taken it to heart is the opposite kind of case like i can imagine a christian who has not messed up but rather who's doing everything quite well who's actually living a pretty good life following most of the commandments of god and you know living at a very high standard of the christian life in many ways and uh, sometimes they begin to feel like god owes them <laughs> you know what i mean it's strange that when we mess up we feel like oh you know what's going to happen and then when we do well we feel like oh yeah now god has to answer my prayer you know god has to do this you know and then when he doesn't we feel like oh how how come he didn't do it you know i did all this and why didn't he do it you know i was faithful to him what's he doing you know he's not faithful to me well again that shows that reveals that what's at the foundation is faulty it's messed up again the way we are thinking and processing this is whether we realize it or not his faithfulness depends on my faithfulness <laughs> because i'm faithful he should be faithful to me it's reverse it should be my faithfulness should depend on his faith because he is faithful i try to be faithful to him you cannot reverse that and say because i'm faithful he should be faithful that, that sense of entitlement and you know sometimes we get upset with god saying you know oh, why didn't god do this why didn't god do that he should have done that you know god's not i'm faithful i'm doing everything that he expects me to do and and look he's not doing anything that shows that again the person has not taken to heart truth number 2 is uh, sometimes we let him down <laughs> that person usually is blind to their own faults blind to their own sins blind to their own weaknesses that person has forgotten where they came from you know like how some people when they come up in life they forgot where they came from and so easy it, it's almost natural it can happen to anybody and even to a christian sometimes it can happen you know we can forget where we came from what is our background what is our background we came from adam <laughs> that adam who sinned made us also sinners born sinners and we also earned the right to be called sinners earned the title ourselves we were given the title and then we lived up to it you know <laughs> that's where we came from our background is sinner enemy of god deserve to go to hell as my background and i dare not forget where i came from jesus died for sinners christ jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom i am chief the apostle paul said and the worst of that he said he worked hard not to forget where he came from and sometimes people you know who live a good life and please god in many ways sometimes they forget that they were nothing to begin with they were sinners going to hell and he's the one who saved them and changed them and transformed their life so that they're even living a good a decent a moral and a holy and this kind of life you know they forgot where they came from oh it's his love it's his faithfulness that's the bedrock that's the foundation because he's see the attitude we should have see they've gone out of a place of gratitude they have left the place called gratitude and they've gone into the place called ingratitude you know ungrateful <laughs> they can't see that every good thing they have is only because of god's pure mercy and grace what right do we have to complain about anything because every good gift every good thing our life our breath everything is from him only i didn't deserve to get anything good i deserved to land up in hell but he saved me he gave me a life he's using me and he's blessing me you know that's the way a person who has both these truths thinks that's the way they think you need both the truths you need truth number 1 jesus will never let me down truth number 2 sometimes i will let him down 
If you know truth number one and not two, it's dangerous. If you know truth number two and not truth number one, also it's dangerous. Let me talk about that. If you know that, yeah, I have let him down. I, I, oh, I'm so messed up. I've messed up again. But if you don't realize that he will never let you down, that he will always be faithful, that he will always love you, then it's even worse, I would say. Oh, boy. <laughs> if you ask me which of the two truths are more important, I would say truth number one. Jesus will never let you down. Jesus will always be faithful to you. Truly, I say to you. <laughs> that's why he said, the, put the truly there, right? I can think of Judas. Maybe Judas, maybe that's what happened with Judas. He realized he messed up at one point. He realized he committed a big sin. <laughs> and he realized his mistake, or at least to a certain degree, I think. But why didn't he go back to Jesus? Shouldn't he have thought, you know, I should go back to, because no matter what I do, he will always love me. He will always accept me. He will always forgive me. He will always take me back. If I simply go back to him, he will take me. Isn't that how he should have thought about Jesus? He was with him for three and a half years. It's a most serious lesson. He didn't do that. He realized truth number two, I messed up. Because truth number one was missing. He just drowned in despair, took his own life. No, there's no excuse for that. No matter how we mess up, no matter how we let him down, no matter what we do against him, no matter how many times we mess up, I'll tell you one thing we need to do, just, just one thing, just go back to him, just Go back to him. You say, I've messed up a thousand times. You don't know what I've done and I've done it again. Just go back to him. I don't need to know what you've done. He knows. And even if you've done it again and again, the only thing you need to do, the one thing you need to do is just go back to him because he will always love you he will always accept you him that cometh to me i will never cast out whoever comes to me i will never push them away that's his promise that's his promise you just go to him and he will he will receive you if you realize you've messed up you know some sometimes christians realize they've messed up because they are more conscious of their sin than others sometimes people in the world are sinning and going about happily christians only are miserable sinning they are the most miserable sinners. <laughs> By sinners, I mean those who sin. You know. <laughs> it's not enough to be miserable. It's not enough to feel miserable about your sin. <clears throat> it's not enough to cry and weep and regret what you've done. You know, <clears throat> all that has its place. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. It's okay to do. You can cry, you can weep, you know. But that's not enough. <laughs> Judas did some things like that. You've got to at some point believe that Jesus will accept you. If you go to him, he will forgive you. He will accept you. And you don't need much faith. You just need faith enough to know that if you go to him, he'll accept you. That's all. He'll forgive you. He will never let you down. He will always be faithful. Don't think of Jesus like a man. You see, men, you know, humans give us maybe like 10 chances when we fail the 11th time, they say, you are done. You know, how many times you want us to forgive you? you know? That's uh, in the human world what to do. We, we cannot give a person unlimited chances sometimes. Not always, right? <laughs> but God is not like that. Imagine if God did away with some of us. <laughs> he said, oh, you've done this 20 times. Go, that's it, you're done. 100 times, 101st time, you're out. <laughs> Thank God, God is not like that. When Peter asked Jesus, how many times should I forgive? You know, Jesus' answer, he gives him a number. But the point there is, keep on forgiving. <laughs> keep on. Because that's how God is. Sometimes God is very scandalous in forgiving. He's very, he's too much. He's too much. I mean, he just forgives and forgives and with you there is forgiveness and therefore you are feared, says the psalmist. People fear God for their forgiveness, it seems. That is, there's no one who forgives like him. He will give you chance after chance. If you, you know, think of the guy hanging beside Jesus on the cross, right? I mean, 
that's as last minute as you can get about to lose your life hanging on the cross and you say you know <laughs> when you come into your kingdom will you please remember me <laughs> just a small line the guy says and for that jesus gives him the highest assurance he ever gave anybody today you will be with me in paradise seems so unfair almost most people wouldn't have given him that chance they would have said you're done with your you know you're finished there's no chance you cannot even come down and get baptized you know huh you're done forget about it it's too late for you <laughs> jesus will never say no <laughs> that's what he says whoever comes to me i will never cast out i'm preaching for the one who's wondering whether he will accept you he will i tell you all you got to do is come back to him and if you sin again come back to him and if you sin again come back to him what is this brother come back to him is that so hard to believe come back to him i tell you if you keep coming back to him he will make it so that you don't leave <laughs> he's too patient with us we are not patient with ourselves we hate ourselves if it were up to us some of us would have already sent us to hell it was they said i'm sick and tired of you you know that's it i've gotten sick and tired of myself sometimes thank god it's not up to us thank god i'm not the judge he's the judge and the judge sacrificed himself for me to show me that there is forgiveness for me that if i simply come to him he will accept me so i'm not saying it's okay to sin i'm saying just go back to him just keep going back to him you begin there <laughs> and he will teach you to stay slowly he will work with you he's patient with you he knows how to transform you he knows that, you know sometimes we 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 want it to happen immediately but there's a process and and there's a journey and and he knows how to lead us and where to take us and and how to get us to overcome the things that we are struggling with so that one day it all this evil is turned for good he knows how to do it and he will do it all you got to do is just keep going back to him just cling to him as the old hymn says nothing in my hand i bring simply to the cross i cling if you come empty handed you can cling more tightly to jesus and it's not how tight you cling either because he holds you tightly you just need to come stretch out your hand just grab him a little bit and he'll hold on tight if you have just a little bit eedy bit a little bit of faith <laughs> that's enough faith enough to come to him that's all he will always be faithful to you will always love you you know i think of david how god gave him after murder and adultery i mean god forgave him not that he did not face consequences for his sin he faced a lot of consequences but god did not abandon him god did not say that's it you're done out <laughs> how ungrateful you are i i took you from a shepherd boy made you king made you the most powerful person and this is what you do no he he forgave him he continued to use him david continued to write psalms and we still today read and meditate and pray those psalms that he wrote after he sinned think of peter think of all these people whom god think of all the disciples you know only god knows what we can we will be tomorrow we don't know our weaknesses nor do we know our strengths we don't know ourselves that's the truth whether you can accept it or not we do not know ourselves enough god knows my weaknesses better than i do god knows my strengths better than i do and he loves me for who i am and he will always love me and he will always be faithful to me if i can just hold on to that you know i can keep going forward and so you know these two truths jesus wants us to hold both these together because that will give us a security in life a stability in life because knowing that he will always be faithful to me and also knowing that sometimes i won't be faithful to him in the old testament as a prophet named hosea god told hosea to go marry a prostitute it's one of the most ridiculous weirdest incidents ever he tells this prophet you go marry a prostitute 
And he goes and marries a prostitute and bears children with her. And she continues being unfaithful. You know, she continues relationships with other men and, and all, all that. And then the whole thing is intended to be a portrayal. And using that, God makes that prophet teach the people of Israel. Just as Hosea's wife is unfaithful to Hosea, the people of Israel have been unfaithful to Yahweh. Just as Hosea's wife commits adultery against Hosea, the nation of Israel has committed spiritual adultery against Yahweh. Instead of worshipping the one true living God, they've gone after other gods, worshipped them and served them. And just as Hosea still keeps his wife, God still does not abandon Israel. It's a very controversial. That's why I say God, sometimes God gets a bit controversial. Too controversial for some, you know. <laughs> and then, you know, see, the point of that is not to say sin is okay, spiritual adultery is okay. No, the point of that is to say, see how good God is and change because of that. As Romans 2 puts it, it is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. You see, if you hold these two truths together, that Jesus will always be faithful to you, but sometimes you won't be. I think when you, when you keep these two truths only, you are more likely to be faithful to him. You are more likely to obey him better. Your obedience will increase. Your whole Christian life itself will go better. Why? Because the pressure is off kind of. You know what I mean? The pressure is off. What do I mean by that? Jesus is saying, listen, I know sometimes you'll mess up. You think I'm surprised by your mess ups? I know. I committed myself to you before you messed up, even though I knew you will mess up. So when he does that, when you see that Jesus commits himself to us, even though he knows our worst faults and weaknesses and what we will do in the future and all that, and despite that, he commits himself to us forever. When you see that, it takes the pressure out in a certain way, you know. It's like, you know, a musician playing the piano. You can go to the best musician and say, okay, here I am standing with a stick, you know. One wrong note and I'm going to whack your hand. Can you imagine saying that? Even the best musician will make mistakes. The guy who doesn't make a mistake, when you, if you say one wrong note and give you one whack, every wrong note you get a whack, you know. You put the pressure on like that, people will start making more mistakes. People think sometimes when you put pressure, you perform better. Not this kind of pressure, not the kind of pressure that we're talking about, you know. People in the Christian life, some Christians, the way they approach Christian life itself is not very great, you know. They say, as long as I do everything correctly, God will bless me. As long as I do everything correctly, as long as I please him, as long as I obey him, God will bless me. If I mess up, then, you know, God won't hear my prayer. If I mess up, then, you know, God won't bless me. If, if you're living just with that kind of dynamic, that is not the kind of life that God wants us to live. God has redeemed us from the law. You know that truth from the New Testament? I don't have time to explain it. What does that mean? He has redeemed us from the law means that he has redeemed us from the threatenings of the law. The law used to threaten us. If you don't do this, you die. If you sin, you die. But now the law, <laughs> Jesus has shut the law in that sense. It cannot threaten his people anymore. It cannot say, if you don't do this, you die. If you violate this law, you die. No, no, no. Because he died for me, for my violation of the law, and he kept the law for me. So now, I am freed from the threats of the law, so that actually, now that I'm freed from the threatening, I actually end up doing the law more better. <laughs> it's not that I now don't do the Ten Commandments, I do it without pressure. <laughs> I do it not because I have to do it, otherwise I'm finished. I do it because this Jesus loved me so much that he gave his life, took my penalty that the law gave me and fulfilled the law in my place so that now I say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? I'll, I'll do whatever you want me to do. <laughs> you died for me, so I want to live for you. What should I do? He says, well, go back and do that itself. <laughs> Yeah, that's how it goes. 
Now, not because you have to, but because you want to. Because you love me, you do my commandments. Now, you know, if you're playing music, you're not meant to be playing music with some guy watching over you with a stick like that. The musician is meant to be left to play with expression. He's meant to just enjoy and just play and just, you know, just in the moment express himself. <laughs> if you're a jazz artist or something like that, or if you're a classical artist, you can express yourself. You know what I mean? You know, music needs to be expressed. It needs to be in a heartfelt manner. You know, there's so much to it. You can't just play the notes. There's expression and there's joy and there's emotions involved. You got to just enjoy it and that's when it comes out the best. If music is like that, what do you think about life? <laughs> if music needs that kind of freedom for expression, life also works like that. When we love God because he loved us so much, our obedience itself will increase. People think, you know, if you teach like this, uh, go, people will go out and one of the criticisms against this kind of teaching is, if you teach like this, people will go out and sin left and right and say, oh, Jesus will always accept me. Jesus will always forgive me. He'll always, you know, uh, give me another chance. And so let me go out and sin all that I can. You know, where sin abounds, grace will abound much more. And so people think this kind of teaching will lead to licentious living. Now, there may be a few people like that who do that. But people who keep on living like that, saying to themselves, oh, anyway, Jesus is going to be, you know, faithful to me forever. He'll never say no. He'll always accept me and forgive me, take me back and give me another chance. And he will take me to the end. Doesn't matter what I do. So let me just go and sin, you know, from now until... This is all I'll do. I'll sin, I'll sin, I'll take full advantage. I can guarantee you that person is not even a real Christian. How can they think like that? What, have they even tasted the love of Jesus? Have they even tasted his forgiveness? You see, if you've sinned and you've received forgiveness from him again and again, you get to the point where you start hating your sin. You're like, he has accepted me so many times. He's forgiven me. So he's given me a second chance. So many, a thousand chances. He's given me. I don't want to get back into this. Not, I hate this. You, know? you develop a greater hatred for that thing. The goodness of God, the love of God leads you to repentance. Leads you to leave that. God takes the pressure out. <laughs> Jesus removes the pressure and he says, listen, I'll always be faithful to you. I'll never let you down. And listen, I know you will sometimes let me down. <laughs> but don't worry. That's not the end of your story. Come back to me. Let's meet over there. <laughs> That's what he tells them. And then I have a world-changing ministry for you. <laughs> I believe this truth applies to us. Because the devil has told some of us, Oh, you are finished. God's done with you, you know. After all, you did this and you did that, right? You let him down. When you hear the voice saying, God can never take you back, God can never accept you, God can never forgive you, who do you think is speaking? <laughs> that voice is trying to keep you from going back to God, right? Who do you think is speaking? It's the devil speaking. Because the devil doesn't want you to go back to him. You go back to him. You defy the devil. <laughs> you trust in Jesus. You go back to him. He will not only receive you. Over time he will change you. He will transform you from the inside out. These same disciples later on became faithful. The same Peter who denied Jesus later on did not deny Jesus. The same disciples, almost all the disciples died as martyrs for Christ. The ones who in a very cowardly manner forsook him and fled that night. Almost every one of them died as a martyr. Gave their very life for Christ. Because Jesus worked with them, changed them. Made them mentally, spiritually strong built up their faith. You don't need much faith today. You just need enough faith to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, forgive me, receive me. That's all you need today. 
And if you keep these truths together, you have the gospel. He will always be faithful to us, even though sometimes we are unfaithful to him. After all, it is for unworthy sinners that Jesus came to die. As the gospel in a, in a nutshell, these two truths put together make up the gospel. Keep them together and may God lead you to experience his faithfulness more and more. You see, let me say one final thing there. Our focus is so important. If we are focusing on, am I being faithful to God? Am I doing everything right? Am I, you know, if in general in the Christian life, no matter what you're going through, if your focus is, if you're always bothered by, am I doing everything right? Am I doing, that's that's wrong. That's a wrong focus. (laughs) Am I being faithful? No, it's wrong. You know, as uh, here, I have a quote from the famous missionary, Hudson Taylor. It's not by trying to be faithful, but in looking to the faithful one that we win the victory. It's not by trying to be faithful, but in looking to the faithful one. The more we see him and we're amazed by his love and forgiveness and faithfulness, uh, we win the victory in every way. In every way. Our character changes, our life changes, we experience more blessing in every way. Let's all stand up. Let's give thanks. Let's worship him. Thank you, Lord, for you are always faithful to us. You never let us down. Never. Never ever. Nothing can ever separate us from your love. So no matter where we are, what we have done, Lord, teach us to come back to you. Just push us enough to come back to you. Lead us enough to come back to you. Because we know if we just come to you, you can, you can take care of the rest. You can do it step by step. You know how to change us. We don't have to be what we are today. You Only you know what we can be and what we will be, oh God. Only you can see what is beautiful within us. And you can even change whatever is ugly into beautiful. We thank you, Lord, for you never cast us out. Thank you for giving us umpty number of chances. Thank you for being so patient with us and teach us to be patient with ourselves. And if we don't realize these truths, I pray you will continue to lead us so that we may realize, oh God, And we want to be more faithful to you. Not so that we can earn some blessing, some favor from you, but because you are so faithful to us. We want to be faithful to you because you are faithful. We want to be inspired by your faithfulness. Help us, Lord, to keep the focus on you, the faithful one. And as we gaze into your beauty and into your glory, as we gaze into the glory of Christ, May we be transformed from glory to glory so that we become more like Jesus. Even in faithfulness. Teach us, Lord, to be faithful in our relationships. Not only in our relationship with you, but also our relationships in the marriage, in our other earthly relationships. Help us to develop the fruit of faithfulness for your glory. Lead us and guide us and bless us. Make us a blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us for now and forevermore. Amen.